Okay, now we are ready. So if you go to Moodle, you will find uh, already the material that I'm going to cover today. Okay, that is uh, lecture one. Uh, before that, I should also go through the uh, process of evaluation. So you will find a file. Can, can you read at the back? Is that big enough? Obviously, that you cannot read. Uh, okay. So, um, you have my contact information. Uh, where is that? My email address is there and my nickname. And uh, the prerequisites for this course are 2160, Math 2090, and 2171. Okay. Um, and as I said, office hours right now, I'm saying that we will meet. Um, oh, my apologies. This should be open. Okay, so I will. Uh, change this and update the uh, web page. Okay, so it'll be either uh, Friday morning or Monday afternoon. And as I've already said, uh, it's an open door policy, so feel free to uh, drop by and uh, discuss any aspect of the course, particularly when you're solving MATLAB problems, you might find that you get frustrated in finding the last bug. Okay, so you should attempt and spend maybe about 10, 15 minutes to find a bug once you've written the program. But if not, the next strategy would be to talk to your colleagues, your uh, classmates, and if you still cannot find the problem, then come to me and I will train you as we go along on how to debug uh, the, these, these programs. Uh, there is no textbook for this course, and uh, so kind of I'm saving you 100 bucks. But I will put, and I have already put on the web page, um, a, a complete set of notes for this course. And also, weekly, I will update uh, the lecture notes. Um, the assessment rules for this course would be as follows. There will be about eight to 10 assignments. Um, can you see at the back? Are you guys able to see in the back? Read it, okay. Uh, eight to 10 homework assignments, uh, almost on a week or 10 day uh, cycle. Um, and uh, there'll be two midterm exams, okay? I've fixed already the date. The first one will be on February 28th, the second one on uh, March, 27th, and those will be in class. Um, I guess I should change the room because last year we had it there. And um, the final exam is scheduled by the university uh, on May 7th. Okay, so I will fix that one. And the mark distribution is 20% uh, for the assignment, 20 and 20 for each of the midterm, and 40 for the final. And uh, I don't have absolute cutoff for determining A, B, C, D grades. Once I get the final total tally based on this distribution, I will basically curve it. I will look at uh, uh, where the breakpoints are. And typically, I will give maybe about 15, 20% of the class as A's, and then I have a person distribution that uh, I will use to determine how many A's and how many B's, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> the assignments are due at four o'clock on the due date. The due date will be posted on the assignment that I distribute through Moodle. And I don't accept any late assignments. So if you don't hand in an assignment, you're going to get zero <laughs> for that particular uh, homework. Um, as, I, as we said, every lecture will be on Moodle. All the assignments will be on Moodle. Solutions to assignments will be on Moodle. Um, this course is essentially about mathematical modeling and computer solution of those mathematical models of chemical processes. We are chemical engineers. So what we will do is we will learn how to the, go through the thought process of how do we understand a particular process description, whether it's a distillation column, whether it is a reactor. And each one of these material you will see in a separate course on separation process unit operations, for example, or chemical reaction engineering. But this course basically opens the door for the process, builds on 2171, where you have done uh, mass and energy balance calculations. 
and it's basically going to build on that uh, mat mathematical part and it's going to build on 2160 in terms of a uh, computer solution. So primarily we will use MATLAB, but I will expose you to other computer solutions as well. Excel, for example, or HISIS, Aspen, uh, the process simulators that um, you will use later on when you go to the design course or in industry as well. MATLAB is also widely used in industry. Excel is used in industry. So you should pick up and become proficient in using any of these variety of computational tools. Let me ask you a question. How many of you dislike computers? That's very good. I'm in a good company now. <laughs> I love computer solution. My own research is on computational aspects of process modeling. Okay, so um, how many of you get, uh, let me try, 2160, you have had a little exposure to MATLAB, right? How many of you enjoyed that process of writing MATLAB? A sarcastic smile. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get at. How many people do not like the process of writing a MATLAB program to implement a particular problem. <laughs> See, now the hand goes up. <laughs> okay, so um, that, that's still I think I'm in a good company because uh, 10 years ago when I was teaching this course, 90% of the class will go up because programming was much more difficult. Nowadays, using computers has become easier and easier. And so um, the number that dislike or hate the process, I think, is dropping. Uh, we will learn about this process of building models. Today we'll start thinking about the th thought process involved in building models. And then classify them. That's another important part. Once I've built the model, I have mathematical equations. That can be algebraic equations. Linear algebra will come in handy. That can be differential equations. Calculus will come in handy. Differential equations will come in handy. But often the problems are nonlinear. Do you understand what one would mean by linear versus nonlinear? If I say uh, I, I develop a model for a chemical reactor and I end up with a bunch of equations, how do I know whether an equation is linear or nonlinear? That is very critical to understand that so that I can use the right tools in MATLAB, in Excel. There are tools that are available for solving a system of linear equations, which you would have seen in linear algebra. And there are system of uh, tools that are available for system of nonlinear equations. Um, I'm not sure by basing it off of like graphs or anything, but well, obviously graphs there's linear and nonlinear. Yeah. But I know that is it the um, independent variable can't be like squared or square. Variable? Exactly, exactly. That's very nice. That's that's the dependent variable. The independent variables are ones that you pick. Okay. So uh, if I write down a set of equations and we will see specific examples and I introduce first a set of symbols to represent various quantities and then I use mass and energy balance okay and I set I end up with a set of equations and I count the number of variables and the number of equations I find that I have more variables than equations then I say okay the difference is my degree of freedom so I can specify some of these variables and then I have number of variables and number of equations matching and these extra variables are what you would call independent variables because I can independently change them. The dependent variables depend on what is specific for the independent variables. And you hit the point right on the uh, spot when you said that it should be quadratic or cubic or anything that is not linear. The dependent variable, you look at the dependent variable, but if the dependent variable is x, and if I have sine of x, it's nonlinear. Okay? Unless it is y equals ax plus b, where it's a straight line. Okay, so of that form, then most of them will be classified as nonlinear. And the classification is important, and most of the chemical processes are nonlinear. Okay, nature uh, by, uh, by design, I guess, is tends to be exhibiting in a nonlinear way. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, classification would be lumped versus distributed and steady state versus dynamic. We will see what these are through specific examples. So the classification, building of the model, classification of the model. Uh, and then solution of the model equations using the computers. This is going to be basically our um, objective. So we will learn how to solve linear and nonlinear systems using MATLAB and we will use something called functional approximation to do curve fitting. How do we do curve fitting when we have a lot of data coming from a plant? Um, numerical differentiation. You have seen differentiation and integration in calculus, but can we do the same thing in computers? Okay, how do I 
take an uh, integral of a set of data? Uh, how do I take a derivative of a set of data? And why would I need that? So that motivation also we should see as we go along. Then we will dwell into solving ordinary differential equations. Sometimes we end up with the equations. When you build the equations, they tend to be uh, ordinary differential equations. Sometimes we even end up with partial differential equations. Has anyone seen what a partial differential equation is? What are, what are they? What? Well, just describe in words what, when did you see it, in what context did you see it, and what, what does it look like? Right. So if you have, if you have something like this, dx dt, we call that as a partial derivative. Okay. So that means that x could be a function of t and some other variable u or v. So we are keeping other variables constant and taking the derivative with only one uh, independent variable for one dependent variable. So if an equation has terms like that, we classify them as partial differential equations. The tools for solving them are going to be different. And uh, we are going to see a variety of tools, MATLAB, Simulink, HISIS, COMSOL, to analyze engineering problems. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go through the general rules. Uh, you, sh you should uh, go through them so that you are familiar with it. But one of the most important things is I like uh, I don't like disruption in the class. And uh, turn off the cell phone, please. And I, th I guess I should do that myself. <laughs> There it goes. Okay. Um, class participation, I strongly encourage that. Uh, we will have some class activities uh, to work in groups. And uh, when, when it comes to working on assignments, uh, my advice to you is it should be done in uh, kind of two phases at least. Uh, when you get the assignment, look at it, think about it alone individually see whether you can understand it because the thought process involved in that is going to be very important. And if you are stuck and you're staring at it, either you should come to me to ask for an explanation or you can talk to your colleagues. What does he mean by this? Okay. And once you have understood it, again, the phase of writing the code should be done individually. Okay. So when you are not able to get the code working, it's okay to talk to other person. What I don't want is work in groups and one person does it, prints out, and then all three of you hand in the same thing. Okay. And then the others who are not are less active in participating in that group are not going to benefit as much. So individual learning is a very individual uh, thing that you should spend time because to get that into your mind by just observing somebody else, you're not going to learn as much. Okay. So I do encourage you to help each other, but work individually on the assignments uh, that I ha hand out. Uh, university policies on scholastic integrity and honesty. This is what I mean. If three people hand in identical assignments and the TA uh, catches it, I have instructed him to give zero to all three because I'm not going to get involved in the process of who did it and who copied. Okay. So if three are identical or two are identical, all, all persons involved in that will get a zero for that particular one. And I do want this kind of a pledge that uh, in every assignment, in every exam, that uh, you should say that I pledge that I have neither given nor received any unauthorized assistance uh, on this assignment, exercise, or examination, and then sign that, sign that up. Um, the course outline, uh, we are going to basically spend maybe five or six lectures on the thought process involved in building models. So we'll build a variety of models and uh, try to classify them. Okay, So that is an important part. And once we have done that, we will move on to developing the tools. So the next set of lectures will be on MATLAB itself. Okay, But I will start using MATLAB in the class as we go along so that you get familiar with it. And um, then we're going to look at individual methods of solving uh, nonlinear algebraic equations, linear algebraic equations, review the matrices, vectors that you have seen, and system of nonlinear equations and ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations, etc. Okay, so its agenda is in indeed very, very uh, lo large. But I, d I do want 
your interaction in the class. Even when, when you are completely silent, there are, there are one of two things under which you will be completely silent. That you don't understand anything I'm saying, or you have understood everything that I have said. Okay, and I think both extremes are very very unlikely. So if you have any question, don't hesitate to put up your hand or call me Kumar and then say what, what what your question is because the same question might be in all other students' mind too. Okay, so it is important, and it, that's just how I get the feedback whether I'm getting to you or not. Okay, so it is very important that you um, ask questions and participate in there. There is a whole set of uh, reference books, and if I take any material from those books, I will tell you during the class. But most of the material I'm going to take are from the lecture notes that I have put uh, on Moodle. So here is my contact. Feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, my calendar is also available on Moodle. Um, so you should be able to see when I'm free, okay, and before you drop in. <laughs> I do use technology a lot, and uh, even in the classes. And uh, I would like some feedback from you also on whether it is helping or whether it is uh, hindering, hindering in the sense of uh, demanding more from you. Uh, the other guideline that I have for every lecture, every hour of lecture that you listen to, you should spend at least four to five hours outside if you want to really understand the course. Okay, uh, so it is going to be a pretty demanding course, and I expect you to put a lot of effort outside the class. Any questions on the basic rules and expectations? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I have given exams of uh, all kinds. I, in one year, I gave a take-home exam. It normally works if there are 30 to 40 students. This class is fairly uh, on the border, I guess, where it is possible. Where I give the exam in the morning, 8 o'clock, you go to the computer, you work out, and then you hand it in by 4 o'clock. Okay? Um, that was not very popular, but uh, an eight-hour take-home exam that you work individually in front of the computer. It's a fairly extensive exam. And I've given an exam, normal exam in the class, uh, where I wouldn't be able to test you on the ability to uh, write and get the program working. And that's why assignments are important. That's where you develop that skill. Okay. So in the exam, what I will do is it will be structured like, uh, here is a process model. I will not even ask you to develop the model because you have only seen it in 2171, and you will see the details of it in other courses. The idea of doing this course at this stage in the curriculum is to be able to use these tools as you do unit operations or as you do reaction engineering separation processes. So the exam will be, I will give you an equation as a describing a particular process, and then we will say, identify what type of model is it? Is it linear or nonlinear? Is it lumped or distributed? Is it steady state or dynamic? Then recommend an algorithm. How would you solve it? Okay. And then develop the algorithm itself. So the process of setting up the solution uh, before you go to MATLAB programming. And that part you should be able to do in the assignment and pick up. And that's the only part I will be able to test if the exam is in a classroom environment like this. Uh, I have had exams where you go to the lab and uh, you do the problem on the computer and submit it uh, within two hour or three hour time period as well. So I'm very flexible. Right now, I'm just thinking that we will just have the two, the three exams will be uh, normal exams in class, just written exam, without any programming involved. The, all the programming will be assessed in through, through the assignments. In an exam, and I will have quizzes from time to time, and these will be uh, particularly useful initially when you're learning MATLAB. So I'll just give you a program with a MATLAB for a particular problem with lots of errors. Say, so go and fix those errors. Okay, so I can give you the program and you just go through it and try to find what the errors are. Or I will say, here is a MATLAB code, try to explain what it does. Go through it, understand it, and try to explain what it does. Okay, those kinds of questions can be asked in a written, written format. Uh, I will put a sample exams from previous years so that you get an idea of how these exams are. So that's your question, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> So now we can get to
we'll just gen in general talk about what what is the process involved in building mathematical models and solving them uh, using computers. This is uh, my own personal view. Can everybody see it there? Can I come on? Maybe very small. This is why it helps if you print out the notes and bring it, and then you can annotate as you like, as we are talking about. So for chemical engineers, the process that we are interested in is any plant, whether it is a gas processing plant, a refinery, a petrochemical chemical complex, or even food processing plants. A lot of the chemical unit operations are used in uh, making ketchup or in making Tabasco or whatever it is. Um, so for us, the world, the, what I call the physical world, is essentially chemical processes, okay? Chemical engineers work with process plants. And what are the things that typically happen in a process plant? In a refinery, for example, you have a crude that comes uh, into the refinery and you're going to put it through a separation device. You're going to produce gasoline, diesel fuel, aviation fuel, uh, kerosene, whatever, okay? And in a gas processing plant, you have a natural gas mixture that comes in and you want to separate the high value pr products possibly, uh, ethane, propane, etc., so that you can put ethylene, polyethylene, propylene, polypropylene kind of thing. And then you take uh, uh, liquefied uh, natural gas, various products. So you're given a fee and you're producing various products. And uh, even in mineral processing, for example, if you take uh, copper ore, the ore is mined, and then you're separating the copper from the ore. Okay? So chemical engineers are involved in separation processes. Uh, things that are mixed, we want to unmix them, we want to separate them. How do we separate them? Using differences in properties. Okay? For example, um, if you have a distillation, a crude, how do we separate the crude into various products? Density is one. Dens how is density used in that? Um, in the column, it's the in, you, you construct a column. Okay, it's called a distillation column. You put the feed in some uh, particular location and you create a vapor, a second phase. Okay, take the crude and heat it up. Create a, so when you heat up, what happens, the lighter material will go to the top and then you condense them and uh, put them in reflex. There are reasons why you do that. And those reasons you will see in a unit operations course. That's not going to be our part. But we want to understand the general principles. So she mentioned density. But there is also another, the density helps in separating the vapor and the liquid, okay? So the vapor is lighter, so it goes up, the liquid is heavier, it comes down. Now, would such a distillation column, if I want to put it in, sp in space, would it work? The density difference really doesn't make any difference because there is no gravity there, right? So the density together with gravity is important for the distillation columns to operate. Now, if you take a lot of these process plants and try to build it in space, you'll have to rethink the whole process because some of the things that we take for granted naturally don't occur there, okay? So density is an important property. Differences in density, in fact, it's the differences in properties that we use to separate, achieve separation. Differences in densities, difference in volatility. In distillation column, that is a very important parameter. When I add heat, the lighter material, so crude is a mixture of many, many hydrocarbons, the lighter material boil off first and then the next uh, heavier material and next heavier material, etc., will boil. So by controlling where I draw my product streams, I can easily separate them, okay? So we use these differences in properties like density, volatility, diffusivity, which you will learn in uh, mass transfer, okay, to achieve separation. The other thing chemical engineers do very well is, the first thing, as I said, separate things that are mixed. The second thing is mix things that are separated, okay? So mixing is a very important process unit in industry. How do we mix it? Why do we mix it? Because we have we want to produce a particular product. For example, in pharmaceuticals, you are producing and formulating a particular uh, medicine. And that medicine is a mixture of many components in there. So you are when you're doing a, a pellet, for example, pelletalizing is a solid. And you, it's mostly uh, a carrier material in which you are adding micrograms of a particular medicine. And you need to make sure that it is distributed very well, okay? So mixing is an important part of things that are separated. The third thing that, you, that we do very well is changing the character of a chemical. So if you give me ethylene and I'm in a, poly, uh, a polymer uh, plant, I'm going to convert that into polyethylene. I'm doing a polymerization reaction. I'm changing the chemical nature of that particular species. Chemical plant consists basically of these three fundamental principles. 
separating, mixing, and reacting. Okay, and there are whole courses that will deal with each one of those aspects. For us, that's our world. We want to understand how these things, uh, processes work, and we want to build models. Why do we want to build models? building it, you want to see if it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Model building is, uh, it gives you the predictive capability <laughs> without building a pilot plant or without building, before I build this, I want to see whether it's achievable. Okay, But does, did model building always precede the actual building of anything? No. We actually observe, if you look at, uh, in physics you would have seen it, right? People have been charting the heavens for centuries and centuries before. The model building as a concept evolved in a very rigorous fashion with Newton in a sense. Newton's law of motion, conservation laws, uh, gave us the first ability to kind of match whatever we observe and then the ability to predict. So the fundamental reason for building models is that their predictive capability. So they, they, we can predict. If we can predict, then we can say, if a crude is coming from uh, Texas today and the plant is operating in a certain fashion, tomorrow it comes from Canada. Maybe on a month later, it comes from Saudi Arabia. The same plant should be able to process different kinds of crude with different compositional uh, mixtures in the feed. And so we want to be able to predict what would be the output if I change the input, for example. And what are the rules that we use in building such models? Here I have this classification. Um, uh, the, the first thing is, as I said, we need to observe. We need to observe and then build a model using certain concepts, certain principles. Okay, So the conceptual model based on thought experiment, that is, I just think about it and try to build a model. A good example of that would be relativity, Einstein's uh, discovery of the uh, theory of relativity. All he did was did a thought experiment of what would happen if there is a guy moving in a train and I flash a light and there is an observer staying outside. And does he see the event as simultaneous or uh, different, okay, when the light reaches the end of these two uh, sections of the train? So that's an example of a thought experiment. But prior to that, people have been, Galileo and others have been observing. We have been distilling alcohol for 2000 years. Making alcohol is a chemical process. We are separating, we are fermenting, we are converting it, and we are distilling it, okay, without really understanding that conservation laws existed or, um, uh, what was the principle of uh, evaporation, people were doing that uh, intuitively. If you go into your kitchen, you'll find that a lot of things that are happening in the kitchen are reactions, mixing, separation, etc. All these things happen. Kitchen is a very good place for chemical engineers to relate to whatever you're learning in the class. Uh, if you are a good cook, you'll find a lot of examples of those. So empirical observations are the fundamental building block, plus thought experiments are less useful useful in engineering, but in physics and astrophysics, they play a bigger role. And using these data, these observations, we can construct two types of models. One, what I would call conservation law based models, which is what you did in 2171. Okay? That is, what does the conservation law state? That mass cannot be destroyed, energy cannot be destroyed. You can convert them from one to the other. So if that principle applies, and if I'm feeding 10,000 pounds per hour of crude, I know I must get 10,000 pounds of products, various products. They may be different in amount. In one crude, I may get more jet fuel. In another feed, I can get more gasoline, for example. But whatever goes in must come out. And that's the basic idea behind all conservation laws, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, etc. The other models are what I call phenomenological models or empirical models. Okay? So th this simply says I observed the position of the planet over a period of time. So I'm going to plot position, the dependent variable on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and I get a curve. And I just fit a curve. And if I see that curve just keep repeating year after year, century after century, then I have the ability to predict based on that data. Okay, And uh, that's again an empirical model without a more <laughs> fundamental understanding of the processes. So using these tools, we build a mathematical model which is an approximation to the physical world. Why do I say it's an approximation to the physical world? It's, Newton's law is an approximation for a long time uh, until Einstein uh, came and made a correction to it. We thought, well, we understood the law completely. 
Okay, but always there is an element of assumptions that we will make as we build the model. And we will see a lot of examples in this course. When I build a model, I'm going to make certain approximations, certain assumptions, because otherwise the process becomes very difficult to uh, model it completely. And once I build that model, which is an approximation to the physical world, I want to classify it, okay, either as linear or nonlinear. And that process you will learn through several examples and classify them as steady state and dynamic. What does steady state mean to you, intuitively again? Stable things are expensive, like it's falling. Uh, what comes out uh, is equal to what goes in is a bit, uh, conservation law, which is also true when things are changing. The concept of a steady state is? Never changes. That's the key word I'm looking for. So if I'm plotting, if I'm plotting, for example, the feed rate as a function of time, okay, and it doesn't change with time, that I would call steady state or an equilibrium state, okay. So those are, uh, they, they lead to steady state models and they are often algebraic equations, in some cases differential equations as well. So dynamic means it's changing with time, okay. <coughs> Typically in a process plan, we would want to operate it under steady state condition. But there are always fluctuations. For example, I'm operating a distillation column, uh, try to maintain it at a steady state, but the ambient temperature changes. One day it's 32 degrees, another day it's 75 degrees. <coughs> How does that affect the plant? Of course, there are heat losses. I'm heating up the material. So if the heat transfer between the environment is different, then its performance can change. And this problem is uh, severe in places like Canada, where the temperature can go to minus 30 degrees. Uh, and all the way to plus 30 degrees. So the perturbations from the environment are always there and the dynamics is our ability to track those changes and reject those disturbances and the course on process dynamics and control you will learn more about how to do that. Okay, But we will build dynamic models so that we understand what are dynamic models. <coughs> Once we build the model and have the classification the next step is getting the solution to it. And for linear problems, what you have learned in uh, calculus, uh, uh, linear algebra, differential equations will help. But most of the chemical processes are nonlinear. And that's where we come to the problem of getting a numerical solution, a numerical model, which is again yet another approximation to the mathematical model. So this is a concept that we are going to kind of follow. And there are a lot of commercially developed numerical simulators that are available. Here are some of the examples, Aspen, Heises, um, there are a number of them for very specific processes. But we will in this course introduce you to Aspen and uh, Heises as well. Any questions? So this is the big roadmap. Okay? So there is a physical process, I want to understand it. So there is a description, I'm describing to you what the problem is. Take that idea, go through the process of building a mathematical model for that. That is part of this course, I expect you to be able to uh, become good at that and then classify it and then solve it. Okay, Here is an example of a typical plant that you could see in Baton Rouge or Lake Charles or wherever you drive. This is a chemical plant. Okay, And what do you see in the chemical plant? You see lots of pipes all around. What do the pipes do? They carry material from storage to the process, to the distillation column. You see a lot of storage tanks as well, okay, that store the crude and then these pipes through pumps. So the fluid mechanics course, you will learn how to design pipes and pumps, etc. okay. So that's a transportation of the material from one place to another place. And then these pipes typically feed into these columns. These columns are the distillation columns. Uh, I will show you how the internal one looks like pretty soon. Okay. And there you have a heater at the bottom, a condenser at the top. You set up this traffic between the vapor and the liquid using the density difference, using the volatility difference to produce a product. Okay. So typically there are streams that are going into the column, into the process unit. There are streams that are coming out. Okay. So how to represent this conceptually? This looks like a pretty big mess. And what we do is we express them as a process engineer in something called the process flow diagram. So this would be an example of a process flow diagram. Okay, so you have some sort of a reaction vessel here, some sort of a separator, a heat exchanger, and there are feeds that are getting in. Okay, and then the products that come out of each stream. And the product from one equipment could be the feed to the next equipment. 
So the entire process plan will consist of many such process units. And you will learn to design and operate them in different courses, you know, a reactor in a reaction engineering course, distillation in a, as a unit operations course, etc. But for our point of view, we are going to apply the principles of conservation of mass and energy to build mathematical models for each one, each one of these process units. This could be a process unit and it has inputs and it has output from there. So we want to relate the output and the input using conservation laws, using the idea that whatever comes in must either stay or leave. Okay? So in transient situation, there might be an accumulation. It might stay, some of it may leave. But under steady state condition, nothing can stay inside. Whatever comes in must eventually go out. Uh, after achieving some kind of a transformation, either separation or um, uh, reaction. So now the question is, what, what is in the stream? When I draw a stream like this, what variables do I have to introduce to characterize that stream, to represent that stream completely? Okay. So when I say that feed stream is coming in, here for example, it says pure oxygen. That's one information that I need. What other information would I need? It's temperature, very good pressure, flow rate. You want to know how much of it is going in, at what temperature and what pressure. And here it says pure oxygen. So that's, that's all you need to know. Okay. Then you have characterized that particular stream. So you know through that stream what enters into the process vessel. And you need to know what happens inside the process vessel. Then you will be able to predict what comes out of the process vessel. Right. So each stream must have a flow rate, a temperature, a pressure, and if the feed stream is a mixture of many components, you should know the composition. Okay, if it is a natural gas mixture, you should know how much of methane, ethane, propane, butane I have in the feed stream. Okay, so that I will be able to track each one of them and predict what the output is. Any questions? <coughs> okay, uh, so the state of a stream is characterized by its concentration, its temperature, its pressure, and its flow rate. When you are using Aspen or Heises, you open up the spreadsheet. The, for the first thing that you will do is you input, you identify what the streams are. Then you identify what the compositions of each components in the stream, its pressure, its temperature, for all the inlet stream. Then it will be able to calculate what the outlet will be for a particular process unit. And that we do by applying laws of conservation of mass, energy, and momentum, coupled with any reaction rate process. Okay, so that allows us to track the state of the inlet stream to predict what the outlet stream would be. So what does the process do to the inlet stream to produce a new kind of an outlet stream? Conservation laws are the basic tools for our purpose. <coughs> so as we already talked about what happens inside the vessel, we either separate a physical treatment or remove species, okay, using all these kinds of properties, density, solubility. Uh, for example, if I have a, a natural gas stream that has H2S, hydrogen sulfide in it, a lot of the natural gas streams have uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, as part of the thing that comes out of the reservoir. And of course, we don't want them. We want to remove them. So how do we do? We dissolve the hydrogen sulfide in a solvent, in a mean, for example. So there we are using the solubility difference. Okay, The hydrocarbons does not dissolve as much in the solvent as H2S. So we can preferentially remove H2S into the solvent. So that's an absorber. Okay, it's a very similar unit to the distillation column. A distillation column, of course, uses volatility and density difference and diffusivity. Um, uranium separation, for example, U235, 238, etc. You make you, when, when you have isotopes like that, that are very close in other properties like density and uh, volatility, you say, okay, one species, one isotope moves faster than the other isotope. So I can use the diffusivity difference to separate those uh, uh, species. And chemical treatment that treat alters the structure of the chemical. An example would be ethylene to polyethylene, propylene to polypropylene, etc. <coughs> okay, so the next thing that we need to understand as we have talked about is the idea of uh, steady state versus dynamic, lumped versus distributed. Okay, <coughs> if uh, these streams that we have been identified with temperature, pressure, composition, and flow rate, if all those variables are independent of time, then we would call that as a uh, steady state. Okay. And the other thing is inside a vessel, when I mix them, if I sample from different parts of the vessel, if I get the same composition, same temperature everywhere, that means the vessel is homogeneous inside. 
<coughs> excuse me that is there is no spatial variation okay then i would call them as a lumped parameter that's an important concept okay so a lumped parameter steady state model or a lumped parameter dynamic model or a distributed parameter steady state model or a distributed parameter uh, dynamic model these are the four basically classifications so you understand what we mean by steady versus unsteady right steady versus dynamic anybody has any questions if things don't change with time it's steady state if they change with time it's dynamic very simple okay but the concept of a uh, lump versus distributed is a little bit more difficult so let me take uh, an example <clears throat> suppose i have a reaction vessel okay and i put certain feed and i have a stirrer and i have some product that comes out of it okay so the feed is a well mixed uh, reactants there are two reactants in there and uh, they are even uh, ethylene for example just one but it polymerizes inside that now why do i need the reactor uh, the stirrer in the reactor it's called a continuously stir tank reactor it's a very common device that is used because i want to mix them as well okay so if the feed comes in if there is no mixer then the feed may just channel like this and there is nothing happened this is a wasted space so we want to make sure that the the feed resides in the reactor for a certain amount of time reacts to a certain extent and the product that you out, get out is not changing with time under steady state it's homogeneous so in order for that to be happening you should have this entire reactor in well mixed homogeneous condition so there is no spatial variation so if i sample a particular uh, product from this part or a part from this they should have the same composition okay and that is what we will call a lumped parameter model there is no spatial variation if there is a spatial variation for example i'm tracking the composition if there is a spatial variation uh, c is the concentration and x is the distance okay x is the distance so if i have dc dx as not being equal to zero what does it mean the concentrations are different different locations depends on where i sample it when that happens i get into differential equations and those are the cases that we will call distributed <clears throat> where do i have that um, there is a spatial variation okay um, then we would call that as uh, distributed no spatial variation lumped with spatial variation we will call it as a distributed model so there are basically two classifications steady versus dynamic <coughs> lumped versus distributed but there are four combinations you could have a steady lumped dynamic lumped or steady distributed dynamic distributed each one will give rise to different types of mathematical models uh, any questions are you familiar are you comfortable with the concept of a dynamic steady lumped distributed <clears throat> okay here we are going to do a, a simple example okay i'm going to do several of these examples uh, uh, in the uh, first five or six lectures in this example what we have is a methanol production unit okay so you have a reactor and the reactor takes in carbon monoxide and hydrogen as the feed so here we have a stream and we represent we are introduce we are de defining the problem okay i'm i am defining the problem to you in a problem statement you need to understand that and you need to go to the process of developing the mathematical model so here i'm saying x <coughs> is the mole fraction of methanol and y is the mole fraction of hydrogen in a mixture and because the, i'm assuming uh, isothermal i'm not worrying about temperature okay but uh, the flow rate is there i need to find out what the flow rates are i need to find out what the outlet flow rates and compositions are. Um, so they are entering this reactor. So the reaction is taking place and methanol is produced. So what comes out here as a product from the first reactor will contain hydrogen, which is unreacted hydrogen, okay, and unreacted carbon monoxide, but the reacted methanol. So the as a product. And if you see this reactor is not a very efficient reactor because I have only 0 0.095 mole fraction of 
methanol, a very small percentage of methanol. So, I cannot simply reject all the unreacted feed. So, what I do is I take it to the next unit, a condenser. Okay? Condenser makes use of the fact that the volatilities of these two materials are different. So, if I condense it, methanol will condense out, but not hydrogen or carbon monoxide. They will be in the gaseous form at the temperature I choose to operate this condenser. So, I need to decide what the temperature should be. It should be between the boiling point of methanol um, and uh, that of uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So, that produces a product <coughs> and I get pure methanol out of it. Okay? And whatever is not reacted and not completely separated. This is a typical problem in any chemical process. You don't achieve 100% conversion in a reactor. You don't achieve 100% separation either. So, here most methanol comes out mostly as a product, but there is some methanol that is you're not able to separate. Okay? So, it will go back in the recycle stream and these are the compositions that are given to you, mole fraction. So, every stream that connects the input to the output, we have a composition, feed rate, temperature and pressure, etc. In this case, temperature is assumed to be uh, controlled as a constant. So, we don't worry about it. We are just focusing on mass balances. And you are given the feed rate of the intermediate stream that connects the reactor to the condenser, 275 moles per minute. <laughs> and you are asked to find out these symbols, X, Y, R, P. X is the mole fraction of carbon monoxide, Y is the mole fraction of hydrogen in the feed, R is the recycle rate and P is the product rate. So, what are, what are these quantities? How can you determine from the given information? <coughs> this is a typical 2171 type problem, right? Have you done these kind of problems before? All you are going to do is a mass balance between input and the output. Okay? So, you are going to say, okay, I am going to take this loop and identify what comes in and identify what goes out and write a balanced equation for every one of those components. Okay, carbon, oxygen and hydrogen. And then once we write down, this is the idea of translating the physical description into the mathematical equation. Once that's done, we will then ask, okay, what type of model do we have? Is it linear or nonlinear? Is it algebraic uh, or differential equation? Is it steady or unsteady? Those things actually come from the description of the problem. So right now I should tell you this is operating under steady state condition, meaning X and Y and R and P are not functions of time. Okay. And the other thing I should tell you is that it is a lumped model, meaning the composition inside the reactor is homogeneous. So that when I take the sample out, there is only one value, it's not changing. So it's a well mixed reactor and the separator has the same kind of a configuration. So this would be a lumped steady state model. I am not going to tell you that it is a lump steady state model in a problem description. I will say that uh, the, con the, the process is operating under steady state conditions okay? and, uh, and then assume that the reactor and the separator are well mixed and that is the cue for you to decide, okay, this is a lumped model, a lumped steady state model. <coughs> Any questions on the problem description? Now we are getting into actually building, so you should have more conversation. <laughs> it's a one-way conversation. Okay, so let me ask you: How would I write? I, I let, this is uh, I often follow this practice. Okay, I have pre-populated notes so that you don't spend all the time writing it. Just listen to it, think about it, ask questions. Okay, that's what I want you to focus most of your time in the class, not just writing down everything. But there will be some sections where we will dynamically develop the equations. Okay. So, I want you to, uh, you can again choose to write it up. If not, I will post the lecture after it is done with all the information that we have written, <coughs> this, the scribbled one that you see on the board. Okay? So, let us look at the process of writing a carbon balance for the inner loop, loop 1. <coughs> Do you understand what I mean by that? I need to track how much of carbon enters and how much of carbon leaves. And that is a balance equation, a material balance equation on the element carbon. Okay, can you help me with that? <coughs> uh, hold on, hold on, you are going fast. Let me just write it out. X plus, did you say plus? Yeah. Okay. 
it's 0 0.302 plus 0 0.004? Exactly. Because you have one carbon atom coming in and one carbon atom coming in with this. So you must add them up. <coughs> so point, uh, 0.302 and point zero zero four less. <coughs> Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're, you're, you're doing very well. You're tracking it, but is, is that... I need to check what are the units. Yeah, question. Yeah, you, need to multiply by the flow rate. you need to multiply by the flow rate, okay? So actually, X here is not the mole fraction. X is the molar flow rate of carbon monoxide that comes in, okay? So every term that you add in an equation like that should have the same units, units of so many moles per hour that is entering and leaving, okay? So this will have the units of moles per hour, and this has only mole fraction, okay? If you go back to the particular problem, you are told these are mole fractions, but this is the molar rate, okay? So many moles, total moles per hour in the stream. So I need to multiply that by, by R, R equals Exactly. Multiplied by? Exactly. 0.274 plus 0 0.095 times 275. I want to make sure that everybody understands here. If you don't understand it, please stop me. Okay. All we have done is taken care of tracking what carbon, where carbon is coming in and where carbon is going. And we are balancing. Under steady state condition, they must balance. <laughs> Okay. And every one of them should have the units of moles per hour. <clears throat> okay, So X is the molar flow rate of carbon monoxide that is entering in here. So you can then simplify this as X plus 0.306 R equals, uh, I guess, times 275. I'm not going to be able to do that product. So that is my equation number one. Okay, I've used principle of conservation on one species. I got one equation. I have four unknowns. X, Y are the molar flow rates in the feed. R is the recycle rate. P is the product rate. I have four unknowns. So I must get four independent equations. Okay, and I have achieved one. How do I get the second one? <coughs> well, on the inner loop, I do a hydrogen balance. Okay, so how would the hydrogen balance look like? Well, I have Y. Okay, I'm, I'm taking H2 now. Okay, so I need to count in terms of the molecule H2. Okay, so I have Y plus 0.694Y plus what? Are you following me? I'm saying that I'm going to track how much of hydrogen comes in and balance it against how much of hydrogen goes out. But I'm taking hydrogen as a molecule. So Y plus what comes in the stream, that would be 0 0.694 plus what? Two times. Two times. That's why I'm passing there. Should be because I have two H2. Okay? So it's two times 0 0.004. <coughs> okay, so it's going to be I'm sorry, I need to keep going back and forth, it's y <coughs> plus uh, 302 plus 2 times 0 0.004 r equals, <coughs> what about material that is coming in? It's going to be 0.631 plus twice 0 0.095. Times uh, 275. That is my equation. So I'm just going to number the equations as 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. <coughs> okay, inner loop oxygen balance. I can do that too. Okay, so that's going to be X, that is one atom of oxygen that is coming in with CO. X plus What do I have for oxygen in the recycle stream? 
<coughs> 0 0.302 plus 0.004, right? Equals, what do I have com that's coming out? 0.274 plus 0 0.095. times 275. This is equation 3. <clears throat> so on that, yeah, question. Um, uh, 0.302 comes from, <coughs> oh sorry, 0.694, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. <coughs> now I have three equations. I'm still not done because I have four unknowns, right? So I need to have one more equation. Okay. <coughs> and we will see that it's not sufficient. In fact, you can compare. If you compare equation one and equation three, what do you find? <coughs> equation one. <laughs> what are they? <laughs> they are the same, they are identical. Okay. Sometimes you will find that they, they are not identical visually, but they contain the same information. For example, if I take the second equation and multiply it by 5, I will get 5x plus something e equals. So it will look, the coefficients will look different, but still it's the same information. In algebra, linear algebra, you would have seen this idea of <laughs> linear independence. Do you remember? Those are abstract. When you're doing linear algebra, it looks like he's talking about what is linear independence and he gives you a definition and you don't understand what is it? Why do I need to know about it? This is why you need to know about it. Okay. When you are writing down a set of equations, if you can derive any one of the equation as a combination of other equations, then we say that equation is not independent. In this case, 3 is not independent from 1. In this case, 3 is identical to 1, but there may be cases where 3 is twice equation 1 or 4 times equation 1. Or there may be cases where it's even more deceptive that 3 is the same as 4 times the equation 1 and 2 times the equation 2 added together. <coughs> so when you look at it, they will look like three different equations, but they are not linearly independent. The idea of linearly independence means that each equation should not be expressible as a linear combination of other variables. If it does, then you don't have a well-formulated problem. So the concept in linear algebra is a very important one for you to grasp and test. And there are tools for testing it in MATLAB, and we will see that. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay, so essentially we have only two equations, two independent equations. So we need to construct two more independent equations. So now we are taking the outer loop and doing the same thing, carbon balance and uh, <coughs> oxygen balance and hydrogen balance, etc. Okay, and then we'll go through and answer these questions. Okay, so outer loop carbon balance, I need your help. I'm sorry, we need to keep going back and forth. It's not a very good thing. <coughs> so the carbon balance for the outer loop is this one. By outer loop, I mean this. So what happens in the recycle stream doesn't even figure in the outer loop. Okay? All you have is one stream that enters and one stream that leaves. Okay? And all you need to do is make a balance. And the balance should be valid whatever the loop that you pick, whatever the control volume that you pick, the balance should be true. So in this case, <coughs> for carbon, it's going to be x is equal to what? <coughs> x equal to p. Very simple, right? X is the molar flow rate of carbon coming in and that should equal to p. Or you can write this as x minus p equal to 0. 
that is equation 4. That is, keep all the unknowns on the left hand side, move everything that is known to the right hand side. Then you will be able to see the how to put this in a matrix form. And once you make that connection of how to put it in a matrix form, you can go to MATLAB and say solve it for me. Okay? No matter whether I have 5 equations or 500 equations, the process is the same. Write down the equations, put it in a matrix form and give it to a solver that solves it for you. <coughs> And what else do we have? Hyd oh, sorry, I wrote this in the wrong place. X is equal to P or X minus P equal to 0. That is equation 4. Now I really need to find my eraser. Okay. I cannot find the eraser. That's the wrong equation. Just strike that out. <coughs> so, pardon me? The next one is the yeah. hydrogen balance, which would be y equals to 2p, exactly. y is equal to 2p or y minus 2p equal to 0. That is equation 5. So, it looks like we have written 5 equations in 4 unknowns, but we already saw that 1 and 3 are the same. So we have four equations in four unknowns and you can test uh, using MATLAB tools that these are indeed linearly independent equations. Those are well, well formulated problem now. <coughs> That's the process of understanding the description and writing a mathematical model using the conservation laws in this particular case and that gives you a set of four equations. The questions that we need to ask is, is this steady state or dynamic? The answer is that it is steady state because we are given that in the problem description. Is it lumped or distributed? It is lumped because no, there, we assume that there is no change in concentration within the reactor. And is it linear or nonlinear? It is. Does everybody understand that? I, I have this tendency when I, one, one person gives me the answer, I assume that everybody understands it and we keep moving forward. Okay, so. That's the correct answer. I heard linear. That's the correct answer. But everybody understands that. Make sure. Why is it linear? Because the unknowns that we have, x and p, there could be a number that is multiplying it, but there is no other variable. For example, if I had y minus xp, <coughs> that will make it nonlinear. Okay, because I have a product of two unknowns, x and p. Or if I have y minus 2p squared, that will make it nonlinear. Okay. So, another way of looking at this is these four equations must be, you must be able to express in the form Ax equal to B, where A is a 4 by 4 matrix, X is the vector of unknowns and B is the right hand side. If you can express them like that, that is separate the coefficients and put them in the matrix form and this is the vector of unknown variables and B is the right hand side of that equation, then you have a linear system. <coughs> Let me ask you. Given these four equations, how many of you will be able to identify what is the matrix A and what is the vector B? And I tell you that this vector X, the vec when I put an underscore, it indicates it's a vector. Okay? So the vector X consists of these variables, the molar fraction, the molar flow rate X, the molar flow rate Y, R and P. So X is a 1 by 4 matrix, <coughs> 1 row, 4 columns. I'm, I'm writing it as a row vector. So x actually contains four unknown variables and that gets multiplied by a matrix, a 4 by 4 matrix A and on the right hand side I will have um, a vector B. And this four equations can be written in this form. When I say that, how many of you can do it? No? <laughs> and that is a key step. Those are the kinds of steps that I will be examining in an exam. You should be able to do that. Given a problem, put it in this form so that you can then write the MATLAB code. In MATLAB, once you have constructed this vector x, uh, a and b, b, the way that you will start this, get the solution is x is equal to a backslash b. One line will get you the solution to that system of linear equations, no matter whether you have four equations or 40 equations same idea. But what you need to be able to do is, from the physical description, we have written the mathematical model. How do I put it in a form that is ready for computer solution? <coughs> <coughs> okay, so 
Um, bear with me because I, I want to show I want to make sure that you understand this process. So I'm going to write down these equations on the board and then we will <coughs> show you how to do that. Uh, so this is just for my sake. Right, right. X plus I have 0 0.306. 306R equals that right hand side, uh, which is 0.369 times 275. You can actually multiply that and simplify that if you want. This is equation one. Okay. <coughs> and the second equation is y plus. Uh, can you simplify this for me? 8. Point seven zero two times R. What was that? Thirty two point Thank you very much. So what is this going for? One point four seven five. Okay. So these are just numbers on the right hand side. And the third equation and the fourth, the third is uh, redundant. So the fourth one is x minus p equal to zero. The fifth one is x minus two p equal to zero. <coughs> oh, sorry, was it x or y? Y minus two. So these are the four independent equations. My question is for you to be able to write this as a matrix multiplied by a vector equals another vector where x, maybe let me write it as a column vector, consists of these four variables, x, y, r, uh, and p. <coughs> okay, and we are going to do that uh, and make sure that you understand it. If, if it's not clear, please ask me. Okay. <coughs> so what I want is, I want this A to be a 4 by 4 matrix <coughs> and I want to separate the knowns from the unknowns. Okay? So this has to be multiplied. We are basically applying the rules of matrix multiplication. X, Y, R, P must equals something on the right hand side. So you put the unknown vector okay, and then build these matrices and try to figure out what should be the various <laughs> coefficients in that matrix when I multiply it, I get back the first equation. Let me repeat. Okay, what I want to do is I want to figure out what do, what should be the number that goes in here, the number that goes in there. So there are four numbers that are going to go in the first row. What should those numbers be so that when I apply the matrix multiplication rule, do you know the matrix multiplication rule? What is it? It's simply <coughs> Whatever appears in this position A11 multiplied by X, whatever appears in the second position multiplied by Y, third position multiplied by R, fourth position multiplied by P, add them up. That should equal what appears on the right hand side. That is what we are going to do. So we are going to analyze this equation and pick the coefficient. So what is the coefficient that multiplies the X? 1. So I would put 1 there. What is the coefficient that multiplies Y? 0 because Y doesn't even appear in that equation. What multiplies R? 0 0.306. What multiplies P? 0. <coughs> so I've taken care of the left hand side. What should be on the right hand side? 101.475. <coughs> so when I carry out that matrix multiplication of the first row with this column and set that equal to the right hand side, the first element. I'll recover my first equation. So that process of uh, formulating in a matrix form is an important before you can solve it on MATLAB. Okay. So do the same thing for the second one. What would be the first element? Zero. Because x doesn't appear in this equation. But y does. So it will be 1 in the next column. And r does. So it's going to be 0.702. <coughs> and the last one would be 0 again and the right hand side would be 32.97. <coughs> I am going to pause now. How many of you do not understand what I have done on this? 
screen. When we started, nobody put up your hand. Now, how many of you can do this for any problem that we give you? We want to make sure that you are able to comfortably handle this. Any questions on this? Okay. <coughs> I would like to see all the hands go up, but <laughs> are you all comfortable doing this process? Okay. Now, I'm going to rewrite the third equation, which was a repetition, okay? Uh, and there is a reason for this. So the third equation is going to be again 10.3060 equals 101.475. And the fourth equation is x minus p equal to 0. So what would that be? 1, 0, 0. What would that be? Minus 1 equal to 0 on the right hand side because there's nothing there on the right hand side. Okay. And the fifth one would be y minus 2p is going to be 0, 1, 0, minus 2 equal to 0. That's all it is. Okay. Write down the, all the equations you can for the description of a particular problem and then put it in the uh, matrix form. Yeah. Yeah, the reason I did that is to show you later on when we go into MATLAB, we actually have five equations and four unknowns. That's not a well-posed problem. But there is a redundancy, which is what I wanted to point out. Redundancy meaning the first and the third row are the same. So do you remember seeing anything about rank of a matrix in linear algebra? Yes. If you calculate the rank of this matrix, the matrix is now five by four, five rows and four columns. What do you think the rank would be? Four. If you get the rank as four, that means there are only four linearly independent equations in there. Okay. So just to illustrate that, when you are writing down the equation, you could get into this trap very easily that you write an equation that is actually a linear combination of other equations. It doesn't look identical, so you don't de detect it. But when you put it to the rank algorithm, it will tell you, oh, this is rank deficient. There is a rank, uh, the number of equations are not matching uh, with the number of variables. Okay. That's the only reason I put that in. To, but we already know that first and the third are the same, so you could strike out well, the, the, the third equation completely. <coughs> uh, solve it in MATLAB. Okay, let me just fire up MATLAB and see how easy it is to solve this problem. Starting out. Oh, there. So you all know how to go to the lab and fire up MATLAB to start MATLAB. We've done that in the 2160. Right? <coughs> so this may be actually a very elementary thing. Given this matrix, how many of you can go into MATLAB and solve the problem? No. Okay. <coughs> It just takes one line after we have defined what the <laughs> matrix is. So the thing that you need to recall from 2160 is how do you define matrices in MATLAB? Okay. So when you start MATLAB, you get these uh, standard layouts, and it's still initializing. So we're going to solve that four equations and four unknowns to get the values for x, y, and uh, r, and p. Hmm. I'm waiting for the prompt to appear um, near the cursor and then only I'll be able to enter. MATLAB is a very interactive environment. That's why it's easy to learn. If you make a mistake, it's very forgiving. It tells you what the mistakes are. Often it's cryptic and so you don't understand until you are uh, familiar with it. Okay. So to define a matrix, all you have to do is create a variable A, set that equal, open a square brackets. Okay. And then you put the elements of that matrix <coughs> uh, in a particular order. For example, here I'm going to put, um, maybe somebody can help me with that. It's, uh, I don't remember these numbers, so I need to flip. 10.3060. Okay. 10.3060. All I'm doing is entering those four numbers in the first row of that matrix 
with a space between them. That means that all of them are going to go into that row. And then I put a semicolon to indicate that it is the next row that I'm going to input. Okay. And once again, I go into that uh, second row, which is 01.7020. Semicolon. So I've entered the second row. The third row, the third row is going to be the same as the first row, 100.3060. Okay, and the fourth row is going to be, thank you, 100 zero, zero, minus 1, right? And the fifth one is 1, sorry, 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 yeah, 0, 1, 0, minus 2. And then close it with the right square brackets. And there you have. So it's interactive, meaning it immediately responds to whatever type uh, command that you type. So the command that we typed is to define a variable, A equals that, okay? There are other ways of entering uh, arrays and matrices, we will see later on, but it's one of the simplest one. So B on the right hand side is going to be equal to 101.475, 32.97, thank you very much, I appreciate that help. The next one is 101 again, 101.475. And if you want to make it as a column vector, you can put an apostrophe there, and that says B is now a column vector. Okay? To get a solution, all you have to say is X is equal to A backslash B. <coughs> there is your solution. For the four quantities, you have to interpret the first one as a solution for X, the molar flow rate of uh, carbon monoxide, second one is a molar flow rate of uh, hydrogen, etc. We're almost out of time, right? So it's a fairly simple environment to deal with, but of course, we, as we go along, we'll develop more complicated problems. And so we'll learn how to use MATLAB to solve those kinds of problems. So I just wanted to go through the whole thought process of describing the model, classifying it, developing the model equations, identifying, and then solving it in MATLAB itself, okay? So we'll stop there and uh, <coughs>